Tuesday, May 7, 2024, I invite you to recite the pledge to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the May 7th agenda. At this time, may I have a motion to add agenda item K, new business, discussion on adequate public facilities, and to rename all subsequent agenda items as appropriate. So move, Pumphrey. Is there a second? Oh, yep. Any discussion? Oh, is there a second? Second, second from Pong. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Jalowski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? <clears throat> Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? <coughs> Ms. Drummond? Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Harvey? Uh, I move to add co a contract to the agenda as a new item, L 26 under contract awards. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Is there a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? Ms. Hen. Yes, my question is, what is this contract? And if Ms. Harvey could speak as to why this did not come to Contracts Committee? Uh, Ms. Hen, it did come to Contracts Committee. It was added on the agenda as L26 last night. And if you scroll down on our agenda, it is the uh, Loyola Graduate Center lease. Thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Jalowski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Dr. Rogers, are there any additional changes to tonight's agenda? I am not aware of any additional changes. Hearing none, the agenda stands as amended. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act to for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, <coughs> assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And uh, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The closed session summary and the open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and certificate appointments. Do I have a motion <clears throat> to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibit D1 through D5? So moved from Paul. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Jalowski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. 
Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval this evening. Director, Early Childhood, mm -hmm. Division of Curriculum and Instruction. Yeah. Coordinator, Multilingual Achievement, Office of World Languages. Fiscal Supervisor 3, Accounting, Office of the Controller. Principal, Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School. Principal, Victory Villa Elementary School. Principal, Dundalk Middle School. Manager, School Safety, Department of School Safety. Specialist, English Language Development, Office of ESOL. Specialist, Elementary Mathematics, Office of Mathematics. Specialist, McKinney Vento, Office of Title I. Specialist, Secondary Mathematics, Office of Mathematics. Assistant Principal, Dundalk Middle School, and Assistant Principal, Orms Elementary School. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Dominowski. Do I have a second? Second from Paul. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Our first appointment this evening is Melissa Adler. Ms. Adler, please stand. She's attending this evening with her husband, <laughs> Brian Adler. <laughs> Brian, he can stand as well. <laughs> All right. Um, she's being appointed as the principal of Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School. With 25 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Melissa's experiences include classroom teacher at Colgate Elementary School, pre-kindergarten teacher and reading teacher at Newtown Elementary School, resource teacher, stat teacher, and kindergarten teacher at Franklin Elementary School, and assistant principal at Honeygo <coughs> Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Dr. Anissa Brown Dennis. She is attending this evening with her mother, Mary Walker, and being appointed as the specialist in the Kenny Vento Office of Title I. With 21 years of prior service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her prior experiences include classroom teacher at McCormick Elementary School, mentor at Johnny Cake Elementary School, assistant principal at Sandalwood Elementary School, principal at Deep Creek Elementary and Gunpowder Elementary School, and director in the Department of Professional Development. Her additional experiences include coordinator of leadership development, middle school director, chief operating officer, and chief school management and instructional leadership officer in Howard County Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome back to BCPS. Our next appointment this evening is Andrea Darian. Andrea is attending this evening with her mother, Brenda Smith. She is being appointed as the Director of Early Childhood Division of Curriculum and Instruction. With 25 years of prior service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her experiences include classroom teacher and reading specialist at Millbrook Elementary School, assistant principal at Scotts Branch Elementary mm -hmm. School, and principal at Campfield Early Learning Center and Chatsworth School. Her additional experiences include classroom teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools. Congratulations. Our next appointment this evening is Alice Devaney Curtis. <laughs> Alice is attending this evening with her partner, William Hessick, <laughs> and is being appointed as manager in the Department of School Safety. With 19 years of prior service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her experiences include school counselor at Owings Mill High, Pine Grove Middle, Sparrows Point Middle, and Pine Grove Middle Schools, and Pupil Personnel Worker at the Department of Social Emotional Supports. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment this evening is Whitney Flannery. 
Whitney is attending this evening with her husband, Jerry. She is being appointed as the Fiscal Supervisor 3 Accounting in the Office of the Controller. With eight years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include Accountant 2 in the Department of Accounting. Prior to that, she served as the Staff Accountant at Rosen, Saperstein, and Friedlander, Associate and Senior Associate at Clifton Larson Allen, and Accountant 3 in Howard County Public Schools. Congratulations. Next appointment this evening is okay. Alicia Freeman. <laughs> Alicia is attending this evening with her son, Francisco Mello. She's being appointed as the Coordinator Multilingual Achievement in the Office of ESOL. With five years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her prior experiences include ESOL teacher at Franklin Elementary School, where she was the Teacher of the Year for BCPS, and ESOL Specialist in the Office of ESOL and World Languages. Prior to that, she served as an ESOL teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools and Director of Admissions and Principal at Archbishop Border School. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment this evening is Ashley Lentz. She's attending this evening with her husband, Phil, and current principal, Dr. Laura Kelly. She's being appointed as assistant principal at Orem's Elementary School with 13 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools. Ashley's experiences include classroom teacher at McCormick Elementary, Chapel Hill Elementary School, and stat teacher and staff development teacher at Deep Creek Elementary School. Congratulations to Ashley. <laughs> Next appointment this evening is Michelle Mochi. Michelle is attending this evening and being appointed as the specialist for elementary mathematics in the Office of Mathematics. With 20 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include classroom teacher, technology integration teacher, and special education inclusion teacher at Newtown Elementary School, classroom teacher and resource teacher at Bedford Elementary School, classroom teacher at Relay Elementary School, and resource teacher in the Office of Mathematics. Congratulations. Our next appointment this evening is Brian Plume. <laughs> Brian is attending this evening with his wife, Mia, and being appointed as the principal at Victory Villa Elementary School. <laughs> with one year of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, his experiences in BCPS include assistant principal at Deep Creek Elementary School, his principal is here, Dr. Laura Kelly. Uh, his prior experiences include elementary teacher, educational associate, math teacher, resident principal, and principal in Baltimore City Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment this evening is Sydney Roll. Sydney is attending this evening and is being appointed as the specialist for secondary mathematics in the Office of Mathematics. With two years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her experiences include resource teacher in the Office of Mathematics. Her prior experiences include classroom teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools, Torah Day School of Atlanta, Cross Creek School of Plano, and Plano Independent School District, mathematics teacher in DeKalb County School System, classroom teacher and director of teacher effectiveness at K-12 Odyssey Georgia Cyber Academy, and classroom teacher and Title I lead math coach at Fulton County School System. Congratulations. Next appointment this evening is Matthew Wickman. <laughs> Matthew is attending this evening with his wife, Morgan, and being appointed as the principal at Dundalk Middle School. With 12... 
With 12 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, his BCPS experiences include social studies teacher at Overly High School, library science media teacher, English teacher, and reading teacher at Kenwood High School, staff development teacher, special education inclusion teacher, and assistant principal at Sparrows Point Middle School. His prior experiences include world, te world history teacher at Israel Henry excuse me, Israel Henny Barron High School, humanities and reading teacher at KIPP Impact Middle School, and assistant school leader, Miles Family Fellow at KIPP Columbus Middle School. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment for this evening is Art Wong. Art is... <laughs> Art is attending this evening with his wife, Sarah Wong being appointed as the Specialist English Language Development in the Office of ESOL with three, three years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools. His experiences include ESOL teacher at Parkville High School. His prior experiences include teacher and ESOL teacher in Howard County Public Schools and EAL teacher at America School Hong Kong. Congratulations. And our final appointment for this evening is Matthew Doty. Matthew is being appointed as the assistant principal at Dundalk Middle School. With 16 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, his previous experiences include mathematics teacher and SAIM learning teacher at Crossroads, Middle, uh, Crossroads Center, STEM teacher leader at Chesapeake High School, and coordinator VLP High School in the Office of Virtual Learning Programs. Congratulations, Matthew. Congratulations to all the promotions um, in the building tonight. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to your service and some of you, your continued service to Baltimore County Public Schools. So let's get a, another round of applause to all of our promotions tonight. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols, which are posted in the boardroom and available in board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior such as language that promotes violence against a BCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Person who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time or prior to that time at the discretion of the board chair. I now call on um, our union representatives and I will start with Billy Burke from Case. Good evening, Chairwoman, Ms. Booker Dwyer, Vice Chairman, Ms. Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of CASE. I'd like to thank the Baltimore Banner for breaking the story that criminal charges were filed in the Pikesville High School fake racist audio case. I'd like to thank Dr. Rogers, the County Executive, and the Chief of Police for holding a press conference to announce those charges and for outlining a plan to provide ongoing support and leadership to the school. What was missing from that day was the human story. Somehow it was lost that this was a deliberate crime against Principal Icewert. Somehow it was lost that this has caused deep and lasting trauma for him and his family. When you are under investigation, you are sometimes put on administrative leave to protect you during the investigation but no one talks about the effects of that four month isolation. No one helps you manage the death threats. No one prepares you that someone will find your wife's cell phone number and begin threatening and harassing her. No one prepares you that someone will find out the schools your children attend and begin to threaten them. No one will tell you 
how to manage your name being dragged through the mud. No one will tell you how to manage that your career has been destroyed. No one will tell you what it's like to not be able to contact your friends and colleagues at work. No one will talk about your innocence even when it's over. No one will tell you how to start again. Every news media outlet has contacted Case and Mr. Icewert for a comment. CNN, Good Morning America, and Education Week have been particularly persistent. They want to hear how this has affected him. Mr. Icewert has not responded because it is not clear that it is safe professionally and personally to tell his story. The people involved will be punished, but they will never take accountability for their actions. They will never restore the harm. No one will apologize for what you've been through, but you deserve an apology. I'm sorry, Principal Icewert. My heart breaks for you. I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me speak on behalf of Case. Okay, our next speaker is Ms. Cindy Sexton from TAPCO. Good evening, Chair Ms. Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Ms. Pumphrey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. On this Teacher Appreciation Day, I just want to thank our hardworking educators for all they do every single day as they shape the minds, nurture the hearts, inspire futures, educate, and, and love our students. There just are not enough words to thank you for all you do as a job that can largely be thankless. But our students need you, love you, and want you to be there for them. And thank you also to all the boots on the ground who work with our students, getting them to and from school safely, feeding them, being their nurse, the office professional who makes sure their records are in order, paraeducators, additional adults, building service workers, and so many more. Thank you for all you do for our students today and always. I hope you're finding joy and appreciation this week and beyond. Thank you, Ms. Sexton. Next are our individual citizens and student groups, and our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening. Um, I have some actual paper for you. You could hand them to Sid. There should be someone over the side. Yes. Thank you. I want to mention uh, a couple of things that I heard last night at a CCAC meeting and some things that I've been mentioning all school year long, some things that I'm observing that are causing me a lot of concern. Um, these are things that we need to do to improve special education. This is not new. You've heard this from me before. Something very key that was mentioned last night at CCAC, collaboration with parents. I can't tell you how many parents I have come in contact with over the last 20 years of doing advocacy who have said, school doesn't want to deal with me, the school doesn't want to collaborate with me. Parents are the best source of special education information on that child and we should want to work with them. Disabilities exist and they don't magically go away. They're there permanently. Just ask my son. Just ask any child who's in a special education classroom. We need to recognize that. Um, students are eligible for special education services. We don't have a specific list of students' disabilities. And I do hear that still frequently. In, in terms of particularly kids who are gifted and talented, kids who are gifted and talented get overlooked quite frequently. 
And there was a young gentleman at CCAC last night who is gifted and talented and also severely dyslexic. And he had to fight, and his parents had to go through due process to get him services and to get him into a school. But because he got his services, because of that fight, he's going to the University of Pennsylvania. He's studying mechanical engineering. He still has a disability. Didn't go away. We have to recognize that even gifted kids have disability. Um, IEPs are legal documents. They need to be followed. Thank you, Ms. Arab. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Farone. Good evening to all. Both Harvard University and the Library of Congress reported and documented Arab explorers and many other slaves coming to America in the 1500s. Estevanico, which stands for Esteban, is one of them. He was a tracker, navigator, helped the Spanish explorers uh, come to the United States right now. His Arabic name is Mustafa Zemuri. So he landed in Florida in 1527. And as you know by history, that about one third of African American slaves have been Muslims. They are from Morocco, Senegal, Gabon, Nigeria. And they have been uh, obviously horribly treated in route and ensuing after. So in the 1700s, uh, there were documents of Moroccans, Moors, in Carolina. There are others. One, Omar ibn Said, which is really my favorite, who had biography in 1831. And he was a trader, a teacher, a leader, <coughs> became by force a slave. He was imprisoned and forced into Christianity like the vast majority of the slaves at that time. My favorite Arab American, most recent, is Ralph Nader, when I came here to Maryland 50 years ago, defending the rights of all. So why am I telling you this? American history, unfortunately, is really full of violence, violent act against human rights, African Americans are on the surface very much. Muslims are not as common. So when you teach students without teaching them about these prisoner slaves who are Muslims, who came to America right from the start, who built America, then that's for us like, like an identity theft. You know, there is a vacuum in public school teachings all over the US and not really just this place. I ask you to amend that. We deserve it. We are the people who brought the Renaissance to Europe through Italy. You know, we had the math, we had the astronomy, we had medicine. And we ask you in the curriculum to include all that. And I really rely on you, Dr. Rogers, more than anybody to make sure that the curriculum department. Thank you, Dr. Farone. Th thank you, Dr. Farone. <laughs> thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. I'm pleased to share with you my superintendent's report for the month of May. I wanna begin by thanking and recognizing all of our teachers across Team BCPS as we celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week. We are truly grateful for all of the work that they do each and every day with our students. We also want to recognize our nurses as Nurses Appreciation, Appreciation Day is also this week.
The first update that we want to provide is on staffing. Um, as you have been able to tell, based on the last two board meetings, hiring season has started officially in Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, we are working diligently to ensure that we have highly qualified staff members in all of our classes, in all of our offices, before we reopen schools in the fall. Of note, our two uh, additional fairs that we have to recruit additional uh, teachers and staff persons. Uh, one is tomorrow for the East Zone at Overly High School and the following week for the West Zone we will have a job fair at Catonsville High School. We are uh, focusing a lot of efforts and attention on retention and so on the slide uh, you'll see several things that we're doing in the areas of uh, in the area of retention a few highlights new summer professional learning that we're excited to kick off this year for all teachers all paraprofessionals adult assistants in Baltimore County Public Schools um, during the summer a brand new teacher induction program an academy a summer academy for all of our principals and assistant principals who are brand new to the job um, bringing back traditional teacher mentors so that there is a person that brand new teachers new to the profession uh, can uh, count on and receive a regular ongoing support from uh, we received information regarding our new revised climate survey the questions were changed to really focus on staff engagement and reduced um, not only uh, did we have more than 20,000 respondents above last year's uh, we also had the highest number ever in terms of BCPS staff members who ever rep responded to a climate survey so we're looking forward to that data being posted on a dashboard and schools and offices working together to create plans for next year and again, we continue working with all of our unions to focus um, collaboratively on our working conditions to meet the needs of all of our staff members in Team BCPS. Specifically, when we talk about hiring, um, I will highlight where we are in terms of teachers and give some comparative data um, for you know the number of vacancies that we have. Uh, currently, we have approximately uh, 304 FTEs uh, to hire for classroom teachers. If you look at the chart, you'll notice that 81 of our schools have two or fewer positions to hire for. Um, uh, you'll also see that we have uh, only two schools uh, out of 176 in double digits. Both schools are secondary schools. Um, and then you, you will see the other numbers on the chart. If we compare uh, to last year, last year we hired 991.3 FTEs for teachers. Um, our current need, including our vacancies and the number of new teachers that we've already hired, uh, is 449. Point nine. Um, we are anticipating, you know, a few uh, additional uh, teachers to hire, uh, but you can see a significant difference in the number of teachers. Um, for this upcoming school year. Uh, we've had a reduction since 21-22, a 22.1% reduction uh, decrease in teacher retirements. And we are very happy to say as of this morning, we only have two teachers um, who remain on our priority teacher transfer list. Uh, more than 99% of our teachers have been placed for FY25. And yeah, that's never happened here before, and we are quite um, excited, and we are very, very grateful uh, to Human Resources, our recruiting and staffing team, for the diligence and their efforts to make sure that we made um, due on our word to all of our teachers that were existing with us, that they were placed in places in alignment with their areas of certification, with their letters, and with preferences that they had shared with us on their DOI for where they would like to be. Um, our principals also took great role in that and our executive directors and so we are proud to honor our current teachers um, in this way. Our next update is on pre-k expansion we want to again share with the viewing public if either you have a four-year-old or you have a neighbor who has a four-year-old who's not yet in Baltimore County Public Schools we are very excited pending County Council approval that uh, we will be opening 43 additional 
full day pre-K programs in the fall. On this slide, you'll see the locations. And if you go right to our website or you go to bcps.org uh, slash parents, you'll find the specific information on how to enroll your children who will be turning four or will be turning five. We're really excited about our efforts to bring more members to Team BCPS. And lastly, we want to provide an update on college and career readiness. Uh, the state board passed revised math college and career readiness standards. Members of the community had reached out um, with some questions and concerns uh, when they had received notice that their students were not college and career uh, ready. The state board has passed that students who have a 3.0 GPA and a final grade of A, B, or C in Algebra 1 will meet math CCR standards. This means expanded access to dual college programs as well to CTE credentialing programs. Uh, we also have a one-time $1 million grant from CCBC and a quarter of a million dollars from county government. Those funds allow us to expand access to our students that are CCR. Um, based on the new requirements, we have more than 2,000 additional students who will qualify uh, for these programs next year, as well as providing access to developmental courses to non-CCR students or non-CCR students who have attended um, CCBC before and um, you know performed well. Um, we are looking forward to more information coming out to our community members regarding the fall and spring course offerings, as well as um, opportunities for students to earn their CTE credentials through our local colleges and community college. So with that, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to provide a brief update on where we are in Team BCPS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers, and thank you, HR, um, because that is a big deal to have that many placements done. So I know it's it's early to have that done for most school systems. So that is a huge deal, and I can just imagine the hours that you all have put in to, um, to get that done. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report, and, and I'm going to keep this brief. Uh, first, just we want to thank the teachers and the nurses. We echo um, what the superintendent has said. We, can, we, we know that thank you is never enough for all the work that the teachers in Baltimore County Public Schools do, um, but we definitely value you and, and glad that so many of you are deciding to stay and have been placed in schools already. So thank you, teachers and nurses. Um, and also thank you to the board members. Uh, working on the board, it truly is every day there is something to do. And every day our board members have either been at an event, whether it's Champions for Children, the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, the BCPS event, Curriculum Night, um, the Towson High School, uh, we, there was a, a a little free library ribbon cutting. Um, we enjoyed uh, the 50th annual CTE student recognition ceremony. So congratulations to 163 students. We put cords on um, and celebrated their CTE achievements. Um, we had a great meeting with our area advisory councils and um, got to hear a lot of their concerns. And, um, and we've all been out at school visits. So it has been nonstop for the Board of Education and we're using all of this information to inform our governance decision. So thank you, board members. The next item on the agenda is the student board members report. And for that, I call on Ms. Drummond. Okay, Ms. Drummond cannot, we're having some technical difficulties. And so um, when we get that fixed out, we'll come back for her student report. Okay. Okay. So with that, we will move on to the items. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Burns. Good evening, board members. Um, there's no item to report on from closed session. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item on the agenda is our um, discussion regarding the Bill 3124 that addresses the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance Task Force recommendations. And before we get started, I just want to um, just kind of set the stage. So we all have a common goal of alleviating and preventing overcrowding in our schools. 
recently the Baltimore County Council put forth Bill 3124 in an attempt to address the adequate public facilities ordinance task force recommendation. As a board, we included support for the task force recommendations in our legislative priorities. I want to be clear that the support of task force recommendations does not correlate with the support of the bill. Task force recommendations define the what, so what um, would happen, and the bill defines the how. There has been misinformation circulating by a board member that the board is in support of Bill 3124 in its current form, and that is false. Today is the first day that collectively as a board, we will discuss the bill and decide next actions that the board will take collectively on the bill. During closed session, we had the opportunity to discuss the legal merits of the bill with our attorney. Legally, this bill is deeply flawed and it's concerning in its current state. And we're gonna engage in discussion about this as a board, but before we begin that discussion, I would like for Dr. Rogers to share the school system's perspective on this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do appreciate the opportunity to share on behalf of Baltimore County Public Schools our response to the proposed legislation. I have had an opportunity to speak with members of our team, an opportunity to review the report from the task force dated December 31st, 2020, as well as review the proposed bill. Baltimore County Public Schools position is that the information that is provided in the task force uh, dates back to 2019. Some of the information that is provided no longer is, is accurate at this time. For example, as of the 2019-2020 school year, there were 27 schools that exceeded the Baltimore County Public Schools definition for overcrowding, meaning 115% at state rated capacity. To date, we have 10 schools that meet that definition. Out of those 10 schools, four of them are high schools. And in those four high schools, there is a specific plan to address each one of them. One of them, an ad addition has began. A new school is planned for one. One school is in design. And for the Northeast, the specific school that is identified, there is uh, a plan uh, for the Northeast high schools that has been shared with the uh, community. Uh, most recently, the community has provided um, feedback. Baltimore County Public Schools shares um, a productive, positive working relationship with the county council and the county executive. Uh, we are all in favor and support reducing overcrowding in our schools. We want our students to have access to high quality learning spaces we want to reduce the percentage of students in our buildings. Um, we are in favor of the county council working to ad address adjacency and the county council taking the necessary steps that they deem appropriate to limit permits. Our concerns are around the creation of an interdepartmental committee on school overcrowding where there are 11 members in the current form where one is selected from Baltimore County Public Schools and one from the Board of Education. It is our understanding from our records that on January 19, 2021, the full board accepted a recommendation to support the recommendations of the task force in a vote of eight through four. At that time, there was a great need for additional funding. Since that date, we have received more than $350 million in built to learn funding, $80 million in pass through grants, $15 million in Maryland Healthy School facility funding and additional funds. Those funds have made a significant difference in how we can address overcrowding in our schools. Additionally, applying policy in Rule 1280, we have worked together to make sure that we have reviewed all of the student counts 
the My iPass study that provides very detailed recommendations for Baltimore County Public Schools, taking into account several uh, factors across all of our school systems. We have been uh, careful to work with our partners to implement that plan and to make sure that our boundary and redistricting process really takes into account all of our stakeholders across the system. In reviewing the accuracy of the student count projections that have been provided to our stakeholders, we have an accuracy rate um, going from year 21-22 through current from 95.64% to 98.38%. And so the information that we have received from our Department of Strategic Planning is pretty accurate. Our Department of uh, Facilities, as well as construction, um, also is more than happy to come together uh, with the county council to work together to figure out a way to um, address overcrowding in our schools. As I said at the beginning, um, we have a positive, productive working relationship. We all support reducing overcrowding in school. What we would like to do is to have the opportunity for Baltimore County Public Schools representation with school system experts to come together with county council to um, address the concerns in the draft that have been provided. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Rogers. I move that we send correspondence from the board to the county council outlining our legal concerns with the bill and inviting the county council to work in partnership with the Board of Education and Baltimore County Public Schools to figure out a way to address overcrowding in schools. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? Ms. Pumphrey. Um, I would just s disagree with um, the statement that we have major legal flaws that we discussed major legal flaws in the bill. Um, we discussed flaws in the language, which I believe can be changed. Um, but the substance of the bill itself, we did not discuss the legality as far as the actual substance of the bill. And so I hear what you're saying, Ms. Pumphrey. There are major legal flaws in that in our legislative priorities as a board, we agree that we would only be in support of items that that do not over that do not infringe on board authority and the language in the bill does just that any other discussion miss Stileski and then we'll go to miss hen can you explain how and so this is what we can so we had a whole discussion so we can call on mr um mr burns could you just give a high level overview of um, some of the legal concerns that we had? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll share the, the basics that I share with the board um, in, our, in our closed conversation, um, because I think it's important, as I mentioned, that these are the same reservations I would share or points that I would make in a conversation with uh, uh, the county attorney's office on this. So there's no, these are not uh, somehow secret concerns. I think in looking at the ordinance, um, Ms. Dominowski and others, uh, I would point out that there are references to departments and that would include the Board of Education. And I think the law is quite clear, notwithstanding some anachronistic provisions that are out there that uh, local school boards in Maryland are not departments of any county government. And it's important not to have such things embedded in a new ordinance because it just ends up, I think, causing future problems for both parties. Secondly is there are a few, th while a lot of the bill talks about recommendations and uh, endorsing and having a committee that would suggest things and, and, and in and of itself that wouldn't be a problem, there are also elements of the bill that direct or in the language of laws, they say shall do things. And a, a county ordinance, um, as a matter of law, can't direct or order a local board in the state of Maryland to do anything. 
right? It, and, and that's just, that's the law in Maryland. And we can certainly in that discussion, I think in the motion that's pending, the discussion that might be had with the county's representatives, we can flush those out. And I don't think any of them are concerns that can't be worked out. There is also a portion um, of the bill of the ordinance uh, as, as it's set forth in the bill that actually requires um, certain elements of the committee um, to be set up a certain way, whether it's the number of board members or whether certain board members are qualified in a certain way. There's an element of it that directs what the superintendent shall do. Again, those would be problematic in a general legal sense. I would think that if the county and the board work out the logistics of how they will work together, you can work through those issues. The last big piece that we talked about is towards the end of the bill, um, there's significant new language that mandates reporting requirements. And again, along the same lines, I do not think that any um, committee, whatever it's called, that's created by a county law can um, mandate reporting requirements of the type that are in this bill right now uh, of the school system, whether it's the superintendent, her team, or the board. So that's a general outline of what I think we covered. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned, board council certainly stands ready to assist in the process and certainly to, to talk with your counterparts and their attorneys to try to work through the issues as, as you direct. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Ms. Dulesky, did you have? Okay, so Ms. Hinn and then I'll, uh, Ms. Pumphrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's important for the public and this board to understand that this bill addresses a problem that while the board benefits from and our public benefits from and our students benefit from, we are on the periphery. This addresses development in Baltimore County and ensuring a smart balance of infrastructure and development to balance that out. It's a problem in a process that is owned exclusively by Baltimore County, by the planning department, by the permitting department, by departments that live within Baltimore County, not within this board, not within the school system, but within Baltimore County. My only concern is that we are trying, we're maybe muddying waters that in which we don't swim. So yes, there are some legal concerns with the language, none of which are insurmountable. And I agree with what we've heard from Mr. Burns about um, the authority and we'd want to address them. I don't think anything we've heard would be cause enough to rescind our support specifically for this bill because it does mirror the task force recommendations. The language itself, and I, I understand that's the the motion on its surface, my concern is that we are losing sight of what this bill does. And having served on the task force, I can say that the purpose was not to overburden the school system, overburden the board, exercise undue authority, or usurp the authority of the board. That was not the purpose. The purpose was to fix something that has been broken a very long time that has resulted in um, an unbalanced system and it's timing we we sought to address the timing of housing development and the timing of building school capacity so that those two coincide together it's not to stop development it's to better support our interests and that's what this bill does and i appreciate um chair booker dwyer saying we we definitely support the interests of um healthy school facilities, facilities that are not overcrowded, we're all saying the same thing there. But to get lost in the weeds of this bill by thinking that this is about the board or the school system is disingenuous. And I think it's important for this board to understand that while we may be in those weeds, that's not what the council is trying to do with this bill. It's trying to fix their own house. It's trying to fix the county's processes for planning and development. And that's what we can't lose sight of in trying to do this. So if we want to let the lawyers wordsmith this, that's one thing. But let's be careful we're not overstepping our boundaries either and trying to turn this into something it's not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. And I just want to do one correction because you were talking about rescinding support. Um, and just to clarify, as a board, we have not collectively decided to support the bill. So we can't rescind something that we never supported. Thank you for that. Nor have we decided to any position on the Correct. bill. Correct. That's what we're working on now. 
uh, Ms. Pumphrey. I just have um, some clarifying questions for Mr. Burns. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Mr. Burns, when you talked about the interdepartmental, um, I, I believe what you mentioned was that the language itself, some wording changes could be made as, for example, changing some of the, in the several places where it says inter, interdepartmental to, I believe you said interagency, would make it um, illegal at that, would make it more legal at that point. Um, and you also just mentioned that concerns with legality as far as wording could be worked out in your opinion. Um, and that the substance of the bill itself was not the issue. Um, mostly just the language and the other points that you made um, in j just recently in your last comment. Is that correct? Uh, no, I, I, would, I would say it's partially correct and, and partially a little more complex than that. Um, uh, Ms. Pomfrey, I'll say this. When I, when I talk about interagency as a preferable way to say something like this versus uh, interdepartmental, that's to clear up the fact that uh, the, the Board of Education and BCPS are not departments of county government. However, when you start talking about interagency commissions or interagency bodies, you still have to also deal with the fundamental issue of what can create them. In other words, what, what body, what legal or lawful governmental body can create an interagency department? And I think I shared with the board the voluntary one that there is in Wacomico, Wacomico, excuse me, Wacomico County. And I also share with you the one that's in the state education article regarding school shared space that actually does link the county and the school system together. Those are the kinds of approaches that I think would pass legal muster. I'm not sure in this bill, as it's kind of set up right now, merely changing the words fixes that problem. Because remember, we also have, as I covered a few minutes ago, the issue of the constituent body itself, like how you put the committee together, what the membership looks like. And then finally, on your last point, the one that I have some, some significant concerns with is the last part of the bill, which is, I believe it's in section, in Article 32, it would be additional language that would mandate reporting. And as you recall, there's several paragraphs of provisions. I, I just don't think this committee can mandate anything to a school system. But that doesn't mean there isn't another technique or avenue to get where you would want to go or whether the, the two bodies would want to go. Any additional questions, Ms. Pumphrey? No questions, but I would like to move to amend. I don't know if that's appropriate before we ask for additional questions. Okay, that, um, let me hear Ms. Harvey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Burns, for providing those clarifications. I, I think we all agree that uh, as a school system, we need to work with our county partners in how we uh, plan development and address the needs of each individual school and our system as a whole. Uh, my concern is, or my question is, uh, in its current form, and I do believe words matter when you're talking about a legal document, um, words do matter and they hold more meaning than just uh, wordsmithing or changing particular words. Uh, I am concerned that um, the way that the bill is written does muddy uh, the roles of the board and the county and that we have, that it would be in our interest to engage in discussions with the county around how we partner with them as an entity, uh, entity to entity, to make sure that we are staying in our lane and that the county is legislating appropriately in, in, in their lane and that we are partnering in a way that doesn't uh, create additional processes that may not be necessary. We haven't even had the opportunity to have a conversation. Uh, this board hasn't had an opportunity to have that conversation. And we have a very strong relationship with our county partners, and I would look forward to uh, continuing that relationship with this particular issue. Ms. Stamanowski. Um, the only thing I'm gonna bring up is that we, I, since I've been on the board, we've been asking you know, help from our county partners in asking about you know, development in the area. How, can we be involved in this? When will you let us know when a development is coming? And maybe this bill doesn't say the way or doesn't have the right wording of what we want, but I think the intention was what we were asking for. And I, I think that if we shelve it, we're making a mistake. I think that we should 
work with them and open the discussions up so that we are not limiting, um, you know, we're not taking, I feel like when I read it just as a bill, I looked at it as they're going to oversee, okay, we're going to look at the, this developer wants to come in and build, say, you know, 20 townhomes or a 50 person apartment. Well, let's look at this school. It's um, it's 100 percent capacity, but the next school over is 95. Well, that doesn't count. It can't like it's it it's it's planning. It's a planning process, and maybe they should have come to us first. And I would like to be given that opportunity, but I, I feel like the intention was true to involve us and to think about us when they are approving permits for buildings that were going to be housing families, children, that would put a burden on our school system. Ms. Harvey? Yeah, I just want to quickly respond. I, I don't think uh, that the intention is, is the issue. I agree that I think we're all looking for the same thing, how we meet the needs of our families and our students in Baltimore County. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, implement a bill based on intent. You have to implement the bill based on what it says. And so if the intention is unclear, as you just expressed, I think that the, the notion that we want to have those conversations as you, as you just expressed to make sure that the bill matches the intent uh, is really important. I don't think we're saying different things. I think we're, we're saying we want the same things. It's just a bill is a legal document, and if it passes in that way, the intent is not going to match uh, what we're going to be, the standards we're going to be held to. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lesky, you want to say, so we'll go Mr. Lesky, Mr. Young, and then Ms. Hinn. Okay, so these are all great points. So then the question would be if we amend the bill um, in support of what county government is trying to do to support us, would the amended bill still be able to pass in a timely fashion? Or would it be, um, I guess, postponed, I don't know the exact word, for such a long time, maybe until the next legislative session next year, that then it has a negative impact in that way? And I don't know if anybody has that answer, but thank you. Yes, so this isn't about shelving the bill. It, it truly is about just inviting, letting the, the, letting the county council make them aware of the legal concerns and inviting them to, so that we could all work together. That's all the, the motion is attempting to address. Right, yep. yeah, thank yep. you for that clarification. So then in terms of a timeline. That would have to be collaboratively. Okay, yeah. okay, yep. helpful, very Mr. helpful, Young. thank you. I don't think we're talking about shelving the bill, just we want to make sure that this bill is legally sound because otherwise you have the opportunity um, for someone, some entity, some developer who disagrees with the a, a outcome that may not be beneficial to them. So we want this to be legally sound. Ms. Hinn. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to distinguish um, for the purpose of my comment and Ms. Harvey's comment that there's language here that we're questioning that's consequential versus language that is not. Um, for instance, some is more of a vernacular mm -hmm. of planners that um, admittedly I had to learn that, okay, they refer to our attendance areas as school districts. Um, so that was something that is familiar to those that will be using this language on a regular basis that is familiar to them. So these types of conversations can shed light on some of that terminology. It's not consequential for our purposes, but when we read it, we may balk at it. Why are they calling our you know, attendance area a school district? That's not how we use the terminology. So things such as that that we may raise an eyebrow over, there are um, several of those examples scattered throughout the bill. Um, terminology such as department. Um, that's terminology that I saw in a county budget for the first time and balked at and thought, why are they calling us the Department of Education, only to find out that that's common terminology and their fiscal services group refers to the Board of Education as a Department of Education. So there is room for at least a conversation to discuss why terminology is the way it is, but I think it's also... Um, not necessarily 
a, a bad thing in, in when those conversations need to happen. Um, but certainly there's, there's opportunity. So I agree with that, but not necessarily a, a legal, legally problematic is what I'm trying to say in wordsmithing. Okay, any other discussion? Uh, Ms. Pumphrey. I, wanted to, I want to move to amend your motion. Mm -hmm. And so my amendment would be to remove the words and sharing that we do not support the bill in its current form based on the legal merits and to replace the words to figure out a way to address, address overcrowding in schools with, let me just make sure I have this right, with um, work in partnership with education in Baltimore County school system to amend the bill to amend the bill based upon those discussions. Wait, could you say that? If, I'm putting it in, a, in okay. the chat also. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if Ms. Pumphrey could reread. Or yes, read just, give me just a second because I'm having a hard time seeing what I have here. And I, and I just, while Ms. Pumphrey is typing, I just want us to, to be aware that it's really about inviting the conversation because we have blueprint for Maryland's future requirements that's gonna impact how many students are in a high school building when we look at the dual enrollment opportunities and apprenticeship opportunities, and um, that was not considered in the task force recommendations. So I think we really need to look holistically at everything, and, um, and that partnership and collaboration um, is going to, to matter. Okay, so the, uh, um, the amendment would be to remove the words, I'll just read, I'll read the motion with the amendment, if that's, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So it would say, I move that we send correspondence to county council outlining our legal concerns with the bill, we invite council to work in partnership with, board with the Board of Education and Baltimore County School System to amend the bill based upon said correspondence. Is there a second? Mr. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I would just, I'll speak to my motion just to say that um, I agree with the comments that we as a board have been um, supporting, of course, the APFO task force recommendations. I believe that the bill works on fixing the issues with the outdated APFO task force recommendations, and it does that in, in part by removing the adjacency clause. I do agree that there are some legal changes that need, need to be made, and I do agree that we also need to work in conjunction with a county council to make those changes as we see fit and as our legal counsel recommends. Um, and that's it for now. Any other discussion? Ms. Hinn. Only to ask that the revised motion be read one more time. Um, if Ms. Pumphrey wouldn't mind, please. It would state, I move that we send correspondence to the county council outlining our legal concerns with the bill. We invite council to work in partnership with, board, with the Board of Education and Baltimore County School System to amend the bill based upon said correspondence. I would move to amend the amended motion, if now would be an appropriate time to do so. And so we have a motion on the floor. We have two motions on the floor. Following action on the motion on the floor. Yes, yeah, so, so let's vote on um, the amendment first. So Miss um, Goldberg, could we have a roll call vote? on the amended language. Is it the Ms. Pumphrey's language? Ms. Jaleski? I have a clarifying question. Yes. So should, is there any discussion? Because I know Ms. Hen possibly had an amendment to the amended motion. So I didn't know if before we voted on the amended motion, if any discussion would be helpful. Point, uh, point of order for the board. This is Darren Burns, Board Council. Remember, at this point in time, the primary motion is just to amend the motion. 
So you're not voting on an amended motion. It's simply, since once it was seconded, it became the board's motion. You're simply voting right now on whether to accept the amendment. Then you would proceed on the primary motion. Okay, okay. thank you. I have a question. Mr. Goodwire, I have a question for Mr. Burns. Yeah, uh, Ms. Hinn. Um, question for Mr. Burns. Would we have then have an opportunity prior to acting on the primary motion to offer a second amendment? I think you would. I think you would have the, you know, now that you, let's assume this passed, you would have an amended motion and you'd have an opportunity to discuss that. And as okay. part of that, there's nothing that stops uh, further amendments. Thank you. Okay. Are we all clear on what we're voting on? We're voting on whether or not to amend the primary motion. Ms. Jalowski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Young? I'm sorry, Ms. Harvey? No. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Demonowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer. No. Motion carries. Amendment. The amendment carries. So we're voting to. So that was the am amended language. So now let's. So we're vo we voted to amend the language of the primary motion. Now we're going to vote on the motion as amended. I move to amend. The motion as amended to insert to following the the first clause of Ms. Pumphrey's motion, and if I ask her to re read it again, um, I'll insert it after the first clause that she reads. I'm sorry, I don't have it up. In, was it the in the I'm chat? So, it was the second part, correct? To to um, amend the bill based upon said correspondence. It was. We invite the council to work in partnership with Board of Education and Baltimore County School System to amend the bill based upon said correspondence. The first part, it was the first part in our cars, in our cars, I'll state what I'd like it to include, to in our correspondence with the council to indicate our support of bill 3124. And then thought to follow that with your, the motion as amended. And yeah, write that in the in the chat. Uh, do you want me to type that in with your chain, please? Because since you know, thank is you. there a second on the amendment to to amend the amendment? Second, still ask it. Any discussion? I'm sorry. I need to do the amended. Okay. Okay. And so ultimately, what Miss Hen support. wants to add is that we support Bill Thirty One. Bill 3134. To indicate our overall support. To indicate our, so it's saying that the board overall supports this bill. Ms. Lichter. Two pieces. One, the reason I had said no to Ms. Pumphrey's amendment is because, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, to amend the bill based on the correspondence. I don't think the correspondence is going to work to amend the bill. I think the correspondence is asking for the collaboration between the two, the county um, government and county school board to then decide what the changes would look like. So I, that I was confused by the idea that we're based on just the correspondence piece. And then my other question, I can't remember, I lost okay. that one. You can come back. Um, I'm, I'm unclear how the board could support something illegal. Um, and Mr. Burns, if you could weigh in, is it appropriate for the Board of Education to send correspondence in support of an illegal bill? Well, I think you could state that you support the intent of the bill. Uh, you could even say support the intent of the bill consistent with prior work with the task force. I think if you say you support the bill in its current form, but with amendments, I think you're, you're potentially causing a conflict with the fact that there is apparently a plan to point out some legal flaws. I think supporting the intent 
um, is different than supporting the bill, if you want to phrase it that way. Okay. I do think, by the way, for your record, you, right now you have one motion on the floor. It's an amended motion, but you just have one motion on the floor. Someone's moving to amend it. I think it's always good to read the fully amended version prior to a vote. So whatever you're doing right now, before anything goes to a vote, just please make sure it's reread as the movement intends it to read. Yes, Ms. Um, Pumphrey is typing it out now in the meeting chat for um, for us to read it. And Ms. Pumphrey? I just wanted to speak to um, Ms. Lichter's comment. Um, that was my intention, so it, the wording may need to be switched a little bit to make that a discussion instead of correspondence. I just wanted to state that. Um, Ms. Harvey and then Ms. Daleski. I just have a clarifying question. I apologize. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a clarifying question uh, regarding the language, and this may be for Mr. Burns, because the motion reads uh, that with, uh, to, to replace the, wait a minute, I'm sorry, um, that we would um, amend the bill based upon said correspondence, even if the word correspondence changes, is amending the bill within our purview? Mm -hmm. Can the board amend the bill? Yeah, the board cannot, but I thought that the language was work in partnership with the Board of mm -hmm. Education and the system to amend the bill. I thought that was the new version. Yes. Okay, the new okay, the new version just popped up. I just wanted to clarify because we're getting ready to vote on. Well, right. I think that was actually the amended version okay. talked about working together to amend. I think you're now looking at further refinement, and whoever's making the motion to amend the current motion just needs to make sure that you say exactly what, read exactly how you would like the amended motion to read prior to a vote on it. Okay, so Miss Pumphrey, could you read your amended version of the bill i've read my we voted on my amendments are you do you mean Ms. no Hens? start with yours so we can just for clarity you already voted yes okay now I, I don't know if i have that Let me just like i move that we send correspondence to county council outlining our legal concerns with the bill we invite county council to work in partnership with the board of education and, and baltimore county school system to amend the bill based upon said correspondence so that's what we voted on to amend the language to. And now Ms. Hinn has put an amendment to add that we support the bill in that okay. language. May I read mine? Yes. Madam Chair. I move that we send correspondence to the County Council indicating our support of the intent of Bill 3124 while outlining our legal concerns and share that we support the bill with amendments. We invite the council to work in partnership with the Board of Education and Baltimore County Public Schools to amend the bill based upon said correspondence. Okay, is there a second? Mr. McMillian, second. your second. Oh, okay, any discussion? I just have a point of order. I'm not, I think that we might have to, I think we're changing the, we're not just inserting language, we're changing the whole thing here. I just not, I'm not sure if this is in order. So I, I think it is. You're, the, the, this, the, the intent of the motion, as I heard it, was to amend the, the motions on the floor. This is what it would look like if this amendment passes. That's all this is. Correct. Adding. Yes, Ms. Howie. As long as it's clear what's being inserted and where, and, and that's what, as long as the board knows what it's voting on, what's yep. clearly being inserted, then uh, if the assembly knows what's going on, then the assembly knows what it's voting on. Thank you. And that's the important part. Uh, so, I agree with that, which is why I prefer to have any, mo any motion or amended motion read into the record prior to the vote. And so we are voting on the amended motion that uh, Ms. Hinn shared, and it's in the chat. So Ms. Hinn, could you read it one more time? You bet. I move that we send correspondence to the County Council indicating our support of the intent of Bill 3124 
while outlining our legal concerns and share that we support the bill with amendments. We invite the council to work in partnership with the Board of Education and Baltimore County Public Schools to amend the bill based upon said correspondence. Okay, it was seconded by Ms. Daleski. We're now opening it up for discussion. Ms. Lichter. Um, we had discussed that our issues with the committee, some of the points that were written into the bill about the role of the committee. So where it says outlining, I'm reading Ms. Hen's um, amendment, outlining our legal concerns does that encompass concerns about the committee's role too, or should it just say our concerns and take out the word legal? So I guess Mr. Burns, does would that fall, does the committee's work fall under legal, or it's just part of the bill? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, part of this is just the tone of, of your correspondence or your communications with your county counterparts. I'm not, I'm not sure, just because you're outlining legal concerns doesn't mean you can't outline other concerns. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So I, I'm going to say, Ms. Lichter, that I think um, it, it doesn't matter which way you choose to do this. If you take out the word legal, you're just leaving room for more. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Keep yeah. in mind, everybody, you're just <laughs> voting whether or not to amend what's on the floor. That's all you're doing, whether or not to amend the motion on the floor. Mr. Young? The one thing I um, disagree with in what Ms. Hen has put forward is the statement and share that we support the bill with amendments because we don't necessarily know what those amendments will be. Saying yes, we support the intent of the bill is good. So Ms. Hen, would you consider modifying and taking that portion out? Yes. I would, or I would um, offer another suggestion of at inserting the word that we support the bill with our suggested amendments. If, if legal concerns could be replaced or substituted for amendments, in other words, if we share our concerns, if those concerns could be understood to be the amendments we would suggest, then would we support it if all of our recommendations were made? That was my thought process in, in that statement without being explicit in stating so. So, Madam okay. Chair, may I, may I interview yes, here? Yes, please. I, 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 think, um, I think an excellent point was made uh, by Mr. Young. I, I would suggest to you that without knowing what an amendment looks like, it's hard to say you're going to support an amendment. And I do think, uh, uh, with respect, due respect to uh, Ms. Hen on this, a cleaner version of this would eliminate that language from and through amendments. I, I'm not saying you, you can't do it. I'm just saying I would prefer you not state support for amendments that we haven't yet crafted and don't know if they'll be in the bill. Thank you. I will withdraw my motion and accept Mr. Young's um, suggestion. And can I do that? It's on the floor. It's on the floor. If Mr. Stil if Ms. It, Stileski. It, it, it's, it's on the floor, so we can vote and Voted. people okay. can vote their way. Ms. Harvey, were you going to say something? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was, but uh, Mr. Burns made my okay. point regarding supporting uh, amendments that we have no uh, knowledge of yet. <laughs> okay, so let's have a roll call vote. Oh, yes, Mr. Young. And this may be a uh, Mr. Burns question. So the, the a possible path forward is to approve this version, but then turn around and amend it to strike and share that we would support the bill with amendments. No. Right now, the motion on the floor, which has not been voted on yet, is simply to amend what has been already amended and is the motion that's on the floor. So right now, or the motion that's up as a primary motion. Right now, you all are simply voting whether or not to amend. The motion maker could withdraw that motion to amend and make another motion to simply take out this language. Would the motion maker like to withdraw the... <laughs> I'd like to withdraw my motion and move the motion that I'm putting in the chat now. Yes. So is, is there, there any objection is there, to the withdrawal of the motion? Any objection to the withdrawal of the motion? Without objection, 
the motion is withdrawn. Okay, without objection, the motion is withdrawn. Thank you. Who knew this would be? <laughs> okay. So, right, and so the ultimate goal is, is that we just want to send an invitation from the board to the county council to support collaboration so that we can all get to the end product. Um, that, that is all we want to do. We don't want to put any language that's saying that we support, that we don't support. We, we want to invite, a, a open an invitation to work together. Um, Ms. Hinn, would you like to read your um, amendment? Yes, or please. Or you move. Go, uh, yes, go ahead. So I move that we send correspondence to the county council indicating our support of the intent of Bill 3124 while outlining our legal concerns. We invite the council to work in partnership with the Board of Education and Baltimore County Public Schools to amend the bill based upon said correspondence. Is there a second? No. So, for, Madam Chair, just remember, this is to amend the motion. So first you have to vote on this amendment and you're gonna have another vote on whether or okay. not to actually approve it. Okay, so let's, so let's vote to, to amend the, to amend the, we're amending Christina, Ms. Pumphrey's original amendment. So let's vote. Do we agree to amend that? Is there, a, is there a motion to amend? It's on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. Let's have a roll call vote. Ms. Delusky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion, it, it, the amendment passes. So now we're going to vote on the amended language that Ms. Hen has put into the chat. Ms. Hen, could you read it again? Sure. The motion as amended. The motion we're going to as vote. amended we're voting on. We're voting on the motion as amended. And just for the record, Ms. Hen. Got it. I move that we send correspondence to the county council indicating our support of the intent of Bill 3124 while outlining our legal concerns. We invite the council to work in partnership with the Board of Education and Baltimore County Public Schools to amend the bill based upon said correspondence. Is there a second? We already seconded. Okay. We already seconded. All right, roll call vote. Ms. Teleski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frampong? No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. The amended motion carries. It, and it, it, this is over now. Well, it's not over. It, it's the start. This is the start of a renewed partnership with the county council. So we will craft that, um, that letter and send it over um, soon. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is contract awards. And for that, I call on Ms. Harvey, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, the, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met on Monday, May 6, 2024. Items L-1 through L-26 were forwarded to the full board for approval. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Board members, are there any Separations requested. Ms. Frimpong. So I had, um, I would like to have, because it's L5 now, and then L22 and L23 separated. So we have L5, L22, and L33. 20, 22 and 23. 22 and 33 separated. 22, 23, okay. Do I have a motion to approve items L1 through L4, L6 through L21, and L24 to 26? 
So, so moved. moved. No. Mr. Young. Mr. Young. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Ms. Frempong, would you like to speak to L5? L5 is the Kelly contract. Um, and so my question, it's, it says in the contract about the Kelly education will deliver high power data and analytics and reporting um, to target support for our elementary and secondary schools. So my question was just since this has been outsourced and it's not handled in house anymore, um, have we seen the number of vacancies filled by the substitutes increase? Are we seeing the vacancies decrease? And, and at what percentage? Um, I think we've had very good experience, but I think I want to call on um, HR or HR partners to come up. Ms. They Laura have, Lowe. And they can give us the specifics. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, we have seen some definitive um, increases but in the positive movement. Um, as a system, we have seen a 43% increase in our filled assignments from August through December of 2023. We have seen an increase of 516 more substitute nurse assignments filled, again, for this year over last year already. Um, we were seeing 57 of our schools with a below 60% substitute fill rate at the start of this year. We are now down to one school that is below 60% fill rate. <clears throat> sure. Okay. Mr. Young. I just have one clarifying question. You said we've seen 516 um, for our nurses. I'm assuming that is like considered one day is a fill as opposed to any kind of um, permanent or semi-permanent placement. So yes, yeah, so the 516 represents um, a daily substitute nurse need for this school year, not necessarily a long-term need, correct? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, may I have a motion to approve item L5? So moved from Paul. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Rempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, Ms. Rempong, would you like to speak to L22? So is it okay if I combine the two of them together? Yes, L22 okay. and L23, yes. So my question was just about the difference in the cost because they are both for um, chilling and cooling tower replacements. But for example, at the Randallstown High School, it's about 600,000 more than the Dundalk Middle School. And even with that breakdown, when you look at the initial bid, there's a difference of $800,000. So the cost is based on the tonnage needed for air conditioning, size of the school matters. So more than likely, it is because of the size of the building. Randallstown is a higher square footage than Dundalk Middle School. Okay, that was all, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, may I have a motion to approve items L22 and L23? <laughs> So moved from Paul. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business, special projects request for Church Lane Elementary School. And for that, I call on Dr. Jones and Dr. Bennett.
Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and Superintendent Rogers. We bring to you today consideration of the privately funded 7330 project request for Church Lane Elementary School tree planting. I'm joined by um, Executive Director Dr. Bennett, and this is a project that's been in collaboration with the Executive Director of Facilities and our Chief of Schools, um, Dr. Grimm. This 7330 special project for Church Lane Elementary Schools allows the students to be able to plant trees and the Patapsco Heritage Gateway Greenway Foundation will be providing all of the materials and doing the pre-digging on behalf of the students. This activity will take place in the spring and if approved, this will be part of a school-wide um, activity that enables students to understand the importance of our environment and the importance of planting trees. The funding for the project is coming from the Baltimore County Department of Sustainability, and there's no cost to the school or Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you for your consideration. May I have a motion to approve the 7330 special project request for a tree planting project at Church Lane Elementary School? So move, Pumphrey. Is there a second? Second to the board. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Stolowski? Yes, Dr. absolutely. Savoy? <laughs> Dr. Yes. Savoy? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempaw? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. We are looking forward to seeing the trees at Church Lane. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report and consideration of the annual update of magnet programs. And for that, I call on Dr. D. Donato and Dr. Elm. Okay, and I'm gonna turn this right over to Dr. Uh, Elmendorf and uh, Mr. Mustafer, and I'm gonna give you, you to click yourself. Ooh. Do I get paid extra for clicking myself here? Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Rogers, and members of the board. Tonight's presentation is to provide an annual report on magnet programs as described in BCPS Board Policy 6400. As defined in that policy, BCPS magnet programs are theme-related curricula and instructional programs, not available as comprehensive school program options. They serve as incubators for innovative instructional practices and draw students across the student attendance boundaries and are accessed through a centralized application and admissions process. Again, this is all according to Board of Ed Policy 6400. Over 18,800 magnet students, representing nearly 17% of our BCPS student population, are enrolled in one of 116 magnet programs at one of 32 locations. Next slide, please. <laughs> That's my notes say, That's so. You. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, tonight, we will discuss with you three types of updates to magnet programs. We are proposing pauses to six magnet programs in which the programs would pause the process of taking new applicants. We are also proposing structural shifts for three programs in which the implementation model would shift from a whole school magnet to a magnet program within the school. Finally, we are proposing the sunsetting of three programs in which they would no longer accept applications with the intent to sunset the magnet program by 2028. Before we get into specific updates, it is important to understand that none of the three types of updates as described on the previous slide, will impact the participation in magnet programming for students currently enrolled in magnet programs or those admitted to magnet programs for fall 2024. All proposed updates would apply to the upcoming magnet application cycle, which opens in the fall of 24, but for school year 25-26. Appropriate staffing and funding will continue to support the programming in which these students will participate based on the type of update. We are proposing that we pause on taking applications for the IB magnet programs at our two international baccalaureate elementary schools and three IB middle schools. Four of the five schools are identified by MSDE as schools in improvement status or CSI and TS ATSI, which we'll hear about in the next presentation. 
The pause will allow the schools to maintain a tighter focus on the BCPS core curriculum and pro programmatic adjustments that need to be made in order to improve academic performance at the schools. The pause would also allow the system to further assess magnet program impact on student achievement and plan for fiscal and staffing implications. The proposed pause is allowable under IB and the IB refers to it as a quote, temporary suspension. During the pause or suspension, IB fees are only paid at 10% of the full rate. If approved, all five schools would maintain the international baccalaureate status and the communities would be notified of the pause. At the high school level, the proposal is to pause the Middle, Milford Mill Academy Instrumental Music Strings, Acting, and Literary Arts Magnet Program seats for grades nine and 10 due to low application numbers for each of these programs. Each of these programs had fewer than eight applicants for fall of 2023. As was shared with the other proposed pauses, the pause of Milford Mill Academy allows further assessment of the program and allows the system and the school to plan for fiscal and staffing implications. The remaining magnet programs at Milford Mill Academy would remain and continue to take applications. Also, it's good to know that the instrumental music um, is offered as a magnet program at Patapsco High School Acting and literary arts are offered as a magnet program at the Carver Center and Patapsico High School. All high schools have string and orchestra programs with the following exceptions, Carver Center, Chesapeake, and Western Tech. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Mr. Mustafer. Thank you, Dr. Immendorf. The part of my presentation, I will discuss structural shifts in our magnet programs. Overall, the, pro the proposed structural shifts will increase consistency among schools and programs across the system. Deep Creek Middle School has a STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics magnet program. Currently, the school is a whole school magnet program. All other middle school magnet STEM programs are programs within a school and not a whole school magnet program. This shift would achieve alignment among schools and programs throughout BCPS. The shifts would require families residing in the Deep Creek Middle Magnet School boundary to apply to the magnet program, just as they do for our other STEM magnet programs. They would not automatically be included in the magnet program like they are currently as it is a whole school magnet. Now, Newtown High School is a whole school international baccalaureate magnet program with the middle years program, a diploma program, and a careers program. The proposed shift for Newtown High School would mirror the IB program that we have at Kenwood High School, a magnet program within a school in which students apply for the diploma magnet program and are considered magnet students. This shift would require families residing in the Newtown High School boundary to apply to the magnet program if they wish to pursue the IB diploma or the careers program for juniors and seniors. Now shifting to Overly High School, Overly High School is also a whole school magnet program with health sciences as their focus. Currently, all students at the school are considered magnet students, even if they do not complete the physical rehabilitation and dental assistant completer pathways. The proposed shift would mirror other health sciences programs currently being uh, held at Eastern Tech, Solace Point Tech, Randallstown High School, and Western School of Technology. So Overly High School would have a magnet program consistent with these schools within their school. This shift would require families residing in the Overly High School boundary to apply for the magnet program as they do the other schools I mentioned. Now, I'm gonna discuss three schools where we wanna sunset magnet programs. Lansdowne Middle School is a career and professional studies whole school magnet program. While unique and innovative when established in 2003, this magnet approach does not align with the BCPS definition of magnet programs since it, since it is no longer unique and encapsulates the work occurring in all BCPS middle schools. If approved, Lansdowne Middle School would complete the sunset in June of 2027. 
Chesapeake High School and Lansdowne High School both are whole school academy magnet schools. Similar to Lansdowne Middle School, this middle school approach does not align with the BCPS definition of magnet programs since it is no longer unique and encapsulates the work occurring in most of the other BCPS high schools. Both high schools would be able to continue offering these courses, just not as a part of a magnet program. For all three schools, the proposed sunset would not impact students currently enrolled in the magnet. The students would finish out their magnet programs through the term of the year, eighth grade and 12th grade respectively. Thank you, Mr. Mustafer. The magnet team will continue to explore and analyze magnet programming across the system, including the expansion of existing magnet programs and new and innovative magnet programs as a part of the annual process for continual improvement. At this time, we are requesting board approval for the changes that we have proposed. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the recommended magnet program changes as presented in Exhibit N? So move, Lichter. Do I have a second? Second, Savoy. Any discussion? Ms. Pumphrey? Just have a couple questions. Regarding the schools that you listed as pause, um, the restart of those programs after the pause, is that an automatic restart or is that based upon um, resulting data during the pause? That would be uh, as, as a result of looking at data and, and actually part of the reason of taking the pause is to look at the um, program and the effect it's having on student achievement and then making a decision based on what, what we can determine during the pause. And would that be a system decision or would that come back in front of the board as far as restarting the programs? I don't know the, the wording from policy 6400 exactly, but the um, changes to magnet programs are a board vote. Okay, and then my other question is regarding the shift. Um, the shift in those, for the schools being shifted, is that um, the reasoning for that based on uh, making consistency throughout the system or is it based upon data that shows that those schools may benefit from the shift? That's a great question. Uh, thank you for that, Ms. Pumphrey. So it's to cr create consistency and it, the reason that those schools are whole school magnets in the first place is because they were all incorporated into the system as a result of a grant that required that they be whole school magnet programs. The schools that are currently have the same magnet programs within a school as opposed to a whole school magnet were not part of that grant and that's why they are structured that way. So this would create consistency among all of the, the schools that have that, those magnet programs that we described. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Young? You mentioned, Dr. Amadorf, you mentioned that those that were whole school were the result of a grant. So is that grant um, something that we are no longer pursuing or bound to? Correct. That was the uh, Magnet School Assistance Program grant, which sunsetted last year. Okay. And my other question is, um, you mentioned that, or uh, Mr. Mostafer mentioned that the with the whole school, all of the students there are considered magnet students. So when you make that change and students have to apply, then we will see a reduction in the number of magnet students. So is there any kind of impact to that reduction in numbers? So there will, the only, the impact will be that it will be specialized for the students who actually apply, making it consistent. So now, let's take Overly High School with their um, dental program. Now, if you're just an Overly High School student, you're considered a magnet student. But with the structural shift that we're, um, that we're discussing, now if you want to be considered a magnet student, you have to actually apply for that program, which would then be consistent with uh, other programs in our, our school system. So again, you're making it a specialized program, it's consistent again with board policy uh, for those particular uh, students who will apply and be accepted into the magnet program. So today, a, using Overly as that example, so today, Today, a student at Overly High, he can just decide to take any magnet class he wants, even though he may not be pursuing, as you said, like a, any kind of dental degree or certification, but going forward, the classes will be limited only to those who have applied to that magnet program. So, Dr. Rogers, oh. new, new applicants. 
Uh, all right. Um, Dr. Elmendorf, I'll start and you can uh, continue. Today, if you are a student in Overly High School, whether or not you're accessing the magnet courses, you're still considered a magnet student. That's inconsistent with our magnet programs in other schools. You're a magnet student if you're in that uh, particular program of study. Uh, and so what this would do was make sure that Overly, anyone who is a magnet student is either in the dental program, and I forgot quickly the second program, uh, you would be in one of those two programs if you were designated as a magnet student moving forward. Uh, Dr. Elmendorf, if I missed anything, that's, I that's invite That's exactly you. right. So it, it's important to, to know that the students who are currently in there would still be considered magnet students. This is only for new applicants starting in the year 25, 26. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go to Ms. Hen and then Ms. Frimpong. Thank you. So my question had to do with um, Overly as well. I'm concerned about the enrollment and the effect that this shift will have on Overly's enrollment given their um, current overcapacity situation. And I'm curious as to how many seats will be allocated for the magnet program since this will shift um, a portion of those seats for magnet. And will we be limiting applications to um, address the enrollment? We can't address all the enrollment issues, obviously, but how will that be determined for them, and can they expect any relief as a result? That's a good question, and I might ask my uh, magnet office uh, colleagues to come up and help me with that, but I can tell you that there, currently each year there are about 60 seats that we open to non-overly boundary students, so students who apply specifically to the magnet. We open 60 seats for ninth graders coming in. <laughs> Good evening. You stole my answer as I was walking straight up. Um, so currently, um, the program at Overly High School does take uh, 60 uh, uh, out-of-boundary students. Um, our projection right now is to continue with that number. However, I think it's important to understand that the Magnet Office works in collaboration with schools, Department of Schools, and strategic planning every year to look at the exact issue that you brought up, Ms. Hen, so that we don't bring in students that then put a school over capacity. Sure, and w would we expect other students to seek other opportunities? Um, I guess not if they could continue in the magnet program. Um, would they be guaranteed? This wouldn't affect current students, so never mind. Right. Forget that question, sorry. <laughs> lots, of, lots of questions, my mind's kind of spinning, but thank you for that information, and thank you for the presentation. Ms. Frimpong, Dr. Rogers, did you wanna? Ms. Frimpong. Um, thank you for the presentation, and uh, Ms. Hen took some of my questions, so thank you. Um, that's okay. Um, so now I have to remember which ones. <laughs> okay. Um, just looking at that map from um, slide two of nine, and this is kind of what the current um, situation is, I was noticing that there are you know, there are not, um, for elementary schools in the Northeast and the Southeast zones, um, you don't really see um, anything listed there. So as we do some um, adjustments, pause, shifts, sunsets, et cetera, can we, or are we also looking at, are there any additions or kind of, again, what Ms. Um, Hen was saying, but specific, can we add more seats somewhere? Can we add programs um, with some of this, these changes that we've got going on? Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Ms. Frempong, I certainly um, appreciate uh, that question. As you know, you know we're, we're taking a holistic view of all areas of the county uh, to make sure that we're representing, uh, we have balanced representation in terms of what we offer for elementary schools in particular. One of the reasons why the recommendation is to make the pause uh, for the IB programs is um, with the new literacy curriculum, with the new math curriculum that we've had a few years ago, and looking at the trajectory for college, uh, career, and community success, uh, we're seeing that we need to really focus a lot of our efforts on making sure that our students excel in all of those fundamental uh, courses uh, before we expand offerings. And so we're looking to enrich. Uh, so I, I think it was uh, last board meeting, we had the uh, science and social studies team come and talk about you know, what they're infusing in the classrooms. We're looking to enrich more than um, adding uh, discrete programs that take away from those core components um, as it relates to elementary uh, currently, but certainly part of the work that we do in equitable resource allocation is um, looking 
at all of our schools across the system at every level uh, you know, when we're offering programs. So thank you for that question. Any other questions? Yep, Ms. Frimpong and then Ms. Domanowski. Um, so I understand that we definitely, we need to focus on the basics um, and we want to improve our student achievement, but I guess I also consider sometimes with these programs and the exposure to these as a way to also get a student excited about learning because they see direct application. Um, we've heard from um, some students who come and they will speak at public comment talking about engineering and being introduced to that in elementary school and kind of that fostering their excitement for that. So I would just want to make sure that we still, there's some way that we're incorporating those opportunities. Um, and then um, as another note on here, because it does say Golden Ring, just one clarification, I think we've heard this before, but when it repeated, Golden Ring Middle School is closing and we're gonna have the new Northeast Middle School, but all of those will be transferred, correct? Yes, and actually, I'm glad you brought that up, Ms. Frampong. That was one of the updates that we gave at this time last year, knowing that Golden Ring was going to go there. So, yes. Ms. Domanowski? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to know, um, with Eastern Technical School and Western School of Technology being listed in the top you know, 10 in Maryland, they're both magnet schools. So when we say talk about sunsetting programs, uh, magnet programs, it's kind of a little bit... Like I, I just, but when we have examples of something that really works, so I understand that it's not aligned with BCPS's, you know, priorities right now. Are they given, or were they given an opportunity to? I mean, could they be given an opportunity to be aligned, or to, you know, have a magnet program that does align, so that we can keep more programs instead of taking them away? That those are great questions. So it's important to know that. Like we said, we're we want to sunset those programs because the courses that they're offering are actually already offered in other schools, and so they can continue courses that are part of the magnet program there. We just wouldn't call them a magnet program. It's also important to understand that it, comparing like a Chesapeake to an Eastern is a little bit of comparing apples and oranges because um, Eastern doesn't have a boundary. They don't have students that are you know are in the Eastern Tech boundary like Chesapeake does. So. I think the short answer to your question is they can continue to offer the courses, they just wouldn't be considered magnet courses. These are just magnet programs inside like a, a school's, like you'd have to apply for a, cer a certain number of seats. It's not you know, having everyone being able to apply for a certain health program or techni um, computers or you know, engineering, whatever it is. So that's where you're, it's just they won't, those seats won't be considered magnets anymore. They will be for the current students, but then Not, once it's right. sunset, so it wouldn't right. be magnet. Okay. Yeah, okay. correct. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Is there a strong possibility when you mentioned Chesapeake and continuing those classes, even though it's not a magnet, is it a strong possibility that those classes won't be offered in the future because there won't be an interest from the students to pursue those classes? I don't, I don't know exactly what would happen in the future, but I can tell you, having been at Chesapeake quite a few times, that there is a genuine interest in many of the courses that are taught there. I know that um, one of the magnet, one of the teachers that teaches some of those courses was the magnet teacher of the year last year for the, for the state of Maryland. So yeah, there, there's definitely some high interest in some of the courses there. I don't know that the students care particularly if it's called a magnet course. Um, I think they're just interested in the content of the course. That's my observations from having been in the building. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Lichter and then Ms. Frimpong. Um, when the career and professional studies at Lansdowne, you're sunsetting, but part of this is incorporated, especially the high schools, into the CTE programs, correct? Because I remember at that, the awards last week, people were getting awards for career and professional studies. So even though it might not be under the magnet, they would be in the CTE program. So is that correct? Yes, so just to add confusion to it, and we're, we're working on this, is some CTE programs are also magnet programs, and mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. there's that. Ms. Frimpong? Um, so for the, for Milford Mill, for example, there were two, uh, there were two programs where you spoke about that there was not a lot of applicants, and then also in making that decision, there were, I guess, other schools that offered um, those programs, as we consider that, is that also going to change transportation so that then transportation will start being offered if the school 
So for example, I mean, I know it was less than eight participants, but if, if travel is an issue, is that now going to be offered for students at the other schools? So students who are currently enrolled in these programs at Milford Mill will continue in those programs. Have transportation, they would continue with transportation. The pause is to stop taking new applicants so we can assess if that program should continue or not. So it should not and will not impact students who currently have transportation. Right, so I understood that. Let me rephrase the question that I didn't ask it well. So one of the things I thought that was considered when looking at these programs is saying, oh, well, Carver has this program or another school has this program. But what I'm looking at is, for example, if a school, if a student is in the Milford Mill um, boundary area, it's not going to be as easy for them to access Carver. So that's why I'm asking about the transportation piece, because some, some programs we offer transportation, some we don't. Right. Yeah, there, there's not, in, the, in these um, proposed updates, there are no proposed transportation updates for any of the, the current magnet schools. Okay. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Stolesti? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the, and thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Academic Achievement Report on Comprehensive Support and Improvement and additional targeted support and improvement schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. I will invite um, Dr. Miller and uh, Ms. Ganeris to come forward to join Mr. Mustafer and Dr. Jones. So I will be honest and um, share with everyone I'm going to try to uh, contain my excitement. Uh, we, I'm being very honest with you. We are very excited for you to hear firsthand um, some of this work that's happening from the school support and improvement team. Uh, based on approval from this board last year, you guys approved a uh, new uh, organization chart. And in that organization chart, uh, you allowed for the development of a school support and improvement team to work specifically with our CSI and ATSI schools to provide targeted support uh, to the schools in a way uh, that we had not provided support before in Baltimore County Public Schools. We shared with all of our principals this summer when we met with them um, that we wanted uh, schools that were designated as CSI and ATSI, although we want them off the list in three years, State says uh, we wanted the other schools to be jealous of the support that they were <laughs> receiving and we wanted help to really feel like help and we have heard throughout the year the difference that this team has made in our schools you're about to see what some of the data changes looks like so it's not just about um, how people are feeling but what does that mean in terms of the impact of students? And all of that work is led uh, by the uh, team members that you see right in front of you. And so I could go on and on, but I will stop and turn it over to Dr. Jones. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Board Chair Booker-Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and Superintendent Rogers. Um, we are excited to share. We have a presentation that we would like to also share along with our discussion. Um, we want to begin with by just saying this is a quote that I really appreciate and it's it says school improvement is not a mystery incremental even drastic improvement is not only possible but probable under the right conditions and that's by Mike Schmoker a lot of us are familiar with his work and I strongly believe that wholeheartedly that school improvement is is something that's intentional and it's not accidental and this team represents the tireless and passionate efforts of school improvement. We are very excited to be able to say that we are working to support some of our lower and underperforming schools to achieve great and um, genuine academic excellence for our students. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see, we have um, somewhat of an org chart uh, there. Dr. Rogers, of course, is the superintendent. I work as the chief of schools, and I'm happy to announce what you'll hear from them um, and present Dr. Um, Kalisha Miller, who is here with us, and then we have Ms. Jen Ganeris, and then Mr. Sam Mustafa, who is actually the executive director 
of school improvement and support. So I will turn it over to them and they'll share more about the um, great and wonderful work that they're doing to make sure that school improvement is not a mystery. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Jones, and thank you, Dr. Rogers. So um, board members the, and um, the, the BCPS community, I'm so proud of this work and like Dr. Rogers, I share her excitement. Mm -hmm. um, the work we do is difficult work, but I'm telling you it's some of the most rewarding work uh, that I've ever done uh, since I was a, a high school principal. Um, and I would not, I could not go on with this presentation without saying again that our work is the vision of our superintendent, Dr. Rogers, and our work is led by the direction of the chief of schools, um, Dr. Jones. So without these two young ladies, we would not be able to do the work that, that we do because I can tell you they give us uh, an opportunity to do our work and to do it well and they ask us constantly what supports uh, are needed. And when you're doing difficult work, um, you need support uh, from the top. So I just want to publicly thank um, our superintendent and our chief of schools for uh, their support and commitment to this work. So our work um, is, is differentiated. So we work with a number of schools. Right now we're working with a total of 21 CSI and ATSI schools, and I'll explain a little bit uh, about what that means um, shortly. Uh, but what we want to do is ensure that the support that we're providing to these 21 schools is differentiated, but also is job embedded. We want to take our support from our offices collectively, take it to the schools while they're doing the work, do the work with them side by side, do the work with, with them behind them as we are providing them the supports and resources to do their jobs effectively so that we can improve student achievement in each of our 21 schools and in every single classroom in those schools. And we're, um, Dr. Miller and Ms. Canaris and I, we will talk about some of that work and how it looks as we're executing that work in the 21 schools. So I just want to um, break down for everyone what is uh, comprehensive school support and improvement and additional targeted support and improvement. There are a lot of words right now on the screen, but I'm going to try to break it down for everyone in layman's terms. So and back in the school year 2018-2019, all um, students were involved in assessment data. MSDE looked at other uh, important data like attendance. Um, they looked at chronic absenteeism. They looked at uh, English learner uh, proficiency. And every um, school system in the state of Maryland received a score based on the, the comprehensive assessment of those multiple data points. They separated all Title I schools in the state of Maryland, and then they ranked them from highest to lowest based on your overall score. The lowest 5% of the Title I schools then created the cut score for every single school in the state of Maryland. So that cut score during the 18-19 school year was uh, 29.667. If you fell below that cut score, and you were a Title I school, you were then considered an ATSI school based on that 1819 uh, data. If you were a non-Title I school and any student group fell below that cut score, you were also considered an ATSI school. Again, back again from 1819 data. Because of the pandemic, uh, 1920, 2021, those um, years were, let's con consider it for uh, lack of a better term, just those years were kind of skipped um, due to the education that was being provided to students at that time. Then uh, we went to the 22-23 school year, same data points, attendance, student achievement, student growth, graduation rate, those, um, all those data points were collected again. All schools then receive, again, um, their specific uh, overall data. And if you were identified in 1819 as an ATSI school for any student group falling below that 29.667 cut score, if you were non-Title I, you were then identified again as an ATSI school. If you were a Title I school, you were then considered a CSI school, a Comprehensive School um, Improvement, uh, uh, Comprehensive School 
and improvement. So that's how you identify CSI schools versus ATS high schools. So it goes back to the 18, 19 school year, every Title I school being ranked, the lowest 5% in the identification of that cut score. So if you're a non-Title I school, you cannot be considered CSI, you can be considered ATSI. If you are Title I and you have two consecutive years below the annual cut scores, you will be considered uh, CSI. So I just wanted to, to break it down sort of in layman's term, and you have the larger description on, on the screen right now. So. Um, as we are working uh, with our schools, I just wanted to share some wonderful data. And, and we wanted to share, we work with a combination of elementary and middle schools. But we know in our system, um, and, and all of you as board members, and you, you've been here now for more than a full school year, you know the middle schools are we, where we have to do some serious work. And it, it doesn't ignore the elementary schools, it doesn't ignore the work in the high schools because overall, as a school system, and Dr. Rogers has said it tremendously over her tenure as superintendent and even deputy superintendent, we know we have to do work as the entire school system at every grade level. But middle schools is where we have to really dig into the work. So we wanted to um, just share some data with you regarding some of the work that we've been doing uh, with our um, ATSI and CSI uh, middle schools. And what the data point that's in front of you now is the Algebra 1 data. And what we used was a pro proficiency rate of 70%. Uh, so all students scoring a 70% or higher. And if you look of the work that we've been doing, and we have some wonderful principals in these schools, some outstanding teachers who work with us collaboratively. You can see mark and period one data, and then comparing mark and period one data to mark and period two, which is that center column. Every one of those middle schools, the students in Algebra one, they increased their scores. Then we broke it down to um, mark and period three, and as you can see, all of those middle schools on your screen now, again, increased their scores for the number of students who were proficient uh, in Algebra one, and. We know that Algebra One students who are successful in Algebra One, the doors that opens for them in high schools are tremendous. They have opportunities to take advanced level mathematic courses, but um, as educators, we understand, but it also opens doors for them to take advanced level science courses because there's so much mathematics involved when you're talking about AP physics. So, if we can continue on the pathway of ensuring that um, our students are leaving middle school and being not only successful in Algebra One but also being proficient uh, in Algebra One, we know the doors that can open for them when they get to high school, and then it'll ultimately open doors for those who will be uh, moving on to colleges and universities to be successful uh, on that level as well. We can't do this work if our um, students are not coming to school. So we are also looking at our chronic absenteeism. And this is one mark that the State Department of Education, this is the highest um, amount of scores that you can receive for any of those data points. So when you look at chronic attendance, um, each school can receive a total of 15 points for chronic attendance, and this is higher than academic achievement, it's higher than graduation or any of the other data points. So it is so important that we get our students in school so that they can learn, but also so that our schools can be recognized for the work that they're doing to turn around the chronic um, absenteeism rate. So if you look at the um, last column, you'll see the percentage of students who are not chronically absent First, uh, at each of those schools. And again, we wanted to make sure that we address the combination of elementary as well as middle schools. So we have some wonderful um, attendance teams working in each of our schools. Um, these are being led by principals and assistant principals in, in conjunction with um, guidance, um, our school counselors, our social workers, um, our, our people personnel workers have, are a tremendous asset uh, to this work. So we're seeing gains across all 
of our schools. This is just a small snapshot uh, of this work, but I have to say we are seeing gains um, across each and every one of our schools, so we have to give major kudos to those who are doing the groundwork in, inside of our schoolhouse houses, and um, we are providing that support uh, to them. So now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Miller so that she can talk about some of the wonderful work that we're doing uh, with our individual schools in a differentiated model. Good evening. As we began this work, it was important for us to ensure that we were speaking consistent language to all of our 21 schools. As a result, we created a leadership coaching tool that is used when we go out to schools to support our principals and instructional leadership teams. This leadership coaching tool was designed around Dr. Rogers' four priorities for our school system, academic achievement, infrastructure, safety and climate, and highly effective teacher, leaders, and staff. The next layer of our coaching tool are the MSDE priorities, the data-driven -dri culture, time, climate, culture and climate, and talent. You'll notice that we layered that under the four priorities identified by Dr. Rogers. It was important for us to ensure that our principals had a seamless transition between BCPS priorities and MSDE priorities. For example, we use this coaching tool, for example, if we go out and we talk about infrastructure. For infrastructure, we may be looking at the master schedule. So we want to make sure that as we're looking at the master schedule, is it aligned to the needs of the students in the building? Is it set up to ensure that there's a seamless pathway for our students to have access to higher level classes as they um, matriculate between middle and high school? Another example is if we talk about budget. We're looking at all the different budgets. Most of our schools are Title I schools, so they may have the operating budget, the Title I budget, the community schools budget. They have third-party billing. So we're looking at all the different budgets to ensure that there's alignment with their CSI plan and SPP plan. As we continue this work, we're having frequent conversations with Dr. Jones around what pieces of this structure can be leveraged for all of our schools in Baltimore County. Working in our department, we have seven specialists, two ELA, two math, two special education, and one English development specialist. Again, it was important for us to all speak the same language as we work with our schools. So we developed a consistent initial meeting agenda that we use when we go out to support schools. As Mr. Mustafer said earlier, our work is not in our office. We're in schools alongside our teachers, our principals, supporting them. So the first step in a support cycle is to conduct an initial meeting with the principal, the leadership team, the support specialist, and the administrator of school improvement. The agenda of the initial meeting includes a learning walk and a reflection, which is then followed by the development of goals for the support cycles. After the initial meeting, the specialists spend two weeks in the school working alongside teachers, instructional leadership teams, and the administration to work on the identified goals developed at the initial meeting. These goals are aligned to their CSI or SPP plan, and again, aligned to the four priorities identified by Dr. Rogers. We also developed an initial support meeting capture sheet to capture our discussions as we are having initial meetings with our schools. This capture sheet serves the dual purpose of identifying coaching goals for building leadership capacity as well as teacher capacity. For example, if we have dialogue under academic achievement and we know that it is evident that the school does not have a robust system and processes for analyzing student data, we work to develop 
those processes with the schools. We develop a school-wide data calendar with data tools that support action plans and monitoring. In conjunction, the specialists focus on building the staff capacity of teachers to analyze formative and summative assessment when intentional planning and monitoring of responsive small group instruction aligned to student needs. Ms. Ganaris will now talk about some of our um, data dashboards. Good evening. One of the things that was very important to our team was to be able to capture the data and the mutual accountability for the work provided to schools. So working with the Department of Research, Accountability, and Assessment, dashboards were created for school support and improvement. We created three dashboards. One for, is for external to show the work of our school support specialist. One is an internal <coughs> dashboard which allows us to monitor the work of the specialist and areas of need. And finally, there is a dashboard for leadership coaching, and that is the coaching that Dr. Miller and I provide that is aligned to the tool that Dr. Miller shared previously. So looking at this front-facing facing dashboard, this, this dashboard is divided into six areas. Supports by fast-forward priority area, activities by area of support, for example, English, math, ESOL support, and special education, supports by activity type, and percentage by activity type and supports by school. So from the dashboard, this was a capture that was taken um, where when it was captured, there had been 109 support activities, 230 or 22.6% for ATSI schools and 789 or 77.4% for our CSI schools. Out of that data, 58% of support was, been, was around academic achievement. 24% around highly effective teachers and leaders and staff, and 17% of the for support was on infrastructure. While the data shows 1% for safety and climate, that is being addressed by our Office of School Climate and Culture through MTSS resource residencies. So we have had 15 schools who have had MTSS resource teacher residencies to date. Ms. Ganaris, I do want to give you credit where credit is due and put on the record that is 1,019 Thank support you. activities, and actually, not 100. I checked before we came this evening, and it's, it's more than that. <laughs> 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 Let me go back and look here. We said 1,019 is now 1,099. So. <laughs> So this dashboard, um, the specialist dashboard is divided into type of visit by area support, support activity, and summary of support that has been provided to each school area. Using this dashboard, we can monitor the type of support provided to each school to determine the placement for upcoming support cycles. We also use this dashboard to look at the type of support that we are delivering. Right now, as new to this work, we are spending a lot of time meeting, those, meeting with schools because we're looking at the initial support cycles. Um, we're spending a lot of time in collaborative planning and visiting classrooms. Areas that we want to continue, continue to grow as we move forward in year two um, is around modeling and co-teaching. So those are two areas that we're seeing that we want to grow into the next school year. This portion of the dashboard shows how our specialists spend their time. As an SSI team, it is a priority that we are supporting schools and leaders in real time. The purple shows when our specialists are in support cycles at schools and the blue shows when they are back at schools to support the sustainability of the at each school. Therefore, you can see that they are in schools the majority of time when you look at that purple and the blue. And this is our leadership dashboard, which highlights the coaching visits conducted by Dr. Miller and I. This data is aligned by fast forward priority area. 
from this data, you can see that we have spent the majority of our time in academic achievement. And the green area is in highly effective teacher leaders and staff. So when we look at academic achievement and we identify the trends, we're also looking at, okay, so what does professional development look like to build the capacity around these areas? You will see the orange section is for climate and safety. And so that's when we're following up on our MTSS support cycles. And finally, you'll see the red is on infrastructure. Currently, we're spending a lot of time in schools looking at infrastructure as they're building their scheduling. We know that that scheduling needs to be designed in a way to uplift our school improvement priorities. At the support cycle's end, a meeting is held to share the support cycle sustainability plan. This document summarizes the support areas delivered to staff during the cycle under each priority area. Resources provided by the specialist are linked within the document. Most importantly, the specialists outline a plan for both immediate and long range next steps, which includes <coughs> follow up support from our team. In concert with the work of our specialists, we follow up on the sustainability of the work by attending data analysis meetings and conducting learning walks to observe the impact on teaching and learning. What you see before you is an elementary support cycle. When we, when we can, we are sending out ELA specialists alongside special education specialists, math specialists alongside special education specialists, and also with ESOL support alongside English and math. The reason for this is that we have to be looking at the supports in context of good first instruction. In this particular example, you'll see that our special education specialist was working on leveraging the continuum of service delivery by looking at a planner and really de redesigning the infrastructure for how the school is supporting special education students. They also worked with what that schedule would look like and what would need to happen in terms of building professional development around that schedule and supports. You will also see the long range plan which, which identifies continuing support throughout the next two years on right out of our CSI group is our <coughs> Our next slide shows an example of a middle school support cycle, special education and math. And one of the things to notice is that elementary and middle looks different. So for our middle school, for example, one of the things that we are supporting our schools on are the, is the articulation for our incoming sixth graders. We know that um, the sixth grade year um, as a former middle school principal is a struggle for a lot of our students. So we're really working with our middle schools on what does that articulation look like to sixth grade to ensure that our students are successful when they get to middle school. And then secondly, in math, looking at the math pathways for our students in middle schools, making sure that they have access to Algebra 1 by eighth grade, which we know aligns to college and career readiness for our students. When Ms. Ganaris and I go out to support principals, one of the first things that we pull out is their sustainability plan because we want to make sure that um, the support that our specialist is providing to our schools that the principals and their leadership teams are keeping up with the information provided to them. So we always first have a discussion around what did the sustainability plan say and what are you and your leadership teams currently doing and then what support may they need if they need additional support to ensure that the sustainability plans are being met. So I definitely um, want to just highlight just a couple of the next steps um, because our work, um, as far as our next steps are concerned, um, our next steps are to be better next year than we were uh, this year because the kids need us to be better. Um, and so that, that, that is just a, the overall summary of our next steps. But two things that I want to highlight from this slide, we definitely want to develop better uh, infrastructure on the middle school level because we know that's where a lot of our work needs to be done. 
And also we want to continue to grow our team as instructional leaders and support the principals in the school. And we're doing that now by our engagement in uh, the research for better teaching um, that our, many of the executive directors as well as our team is engaged in now. So that those are two of the highlights that, that I want to talk about. But I also want to definitely give thanks uh, publicly to our seven specialists. We've hired some uh, excellent specialists. Um, they are some talented uh, young ladies, and we're receiving some excellent feedback from our principals as well as the teachers that they uh, work with each and every day. So um, thank you definitely for the opportunity to just share uh, some of the work uh, that we're doing. And, and as I stated, um, our goal is to ensure that we continue to get better and to grow in our work so that we can provide um, better support next year than we have this year. Thank you. I see why Dr. Rogers is excited about this because this is very um, exciting work. As I'm looking at it, it's aligned to research mm -hmm. informed practices mm -hmm. for school improvement. So every, I was going through my mental notes and just checking <laughs> off like, yeah, they're doing that, they're doing that. They're doing. So this is very, very exciting. Um, let's open it up for questions. Any questions by board members? Ms. Frimpong. No questions, but again, just wanted to say great job for you and your team and what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. This was great. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I had a thousand questions too, but I was. <laughs> Yeah. The next item on the agenda is the report on the progress of the enterprise resource planning system. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Um, at this time, Mr. Augusto, Mr. McCall, and Mr. Hartlove are going to come and provide uh, another update on our ERP um, system. Um, again, I want to thank this board uh, for your uh, vote and your support uh, to help us move forward with this project. Um, uh, Mr. Corns is uh, somewhere uh, around here. While I don't see him <laughs> coming to the front, I would be remiss if I did not um, uh, publicly thank him for his leadership on this project, bringing together three of our major divisions. Um, he has done a lot of that uh, work. They meet weekly. This is a full-time job. And um, you will hear shortly that with this tremendous undertaking that will touch every aspect of our school system, uh, for people who are part of the school system and people who endeavor to become a part of Baltimore County Public Schools, uh, we are in great shape in terms of where we are in our overall project status. And so with that, I'll turn it over to the team. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. I have to say, first before we even get started, it's a tough act to follow here. <laughs> Coming up. Uh, can you have the slide put up, presentation? There we go, okay, right there, that'll be great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I wanna go ahead and get started. This is the second um, of our ERP updates, and um, again, as Dr. Rogers mentioned, it's a very important initiative that we've undertaken. There are a lot of um, invisible, I'll say, things, back office, background things that we're doing, but the impact to what we're doing is very, very great, and it's felt when things break, we hear about it. So um, again, thank you uh, for allowing me to, uh, along with my colleagues here, to give a brief uh, presentation on where we are today. Um, let's get this working. Okay, but before we get started on giving you where we are, I just wanna do a quick recap of what ERP is, why we're doing this. So um, ERP, Enterprise Resource uh, Planning, is a platform, as I mentioned. It There are functions within any organization that have basic synergies. Finance, HR, budgeting, procurement. Those in the past have been done by disparate, separate systems, not really talking to each other. With an ERP system, we get a platform that can allow those um, back office functions to talk to each other, work more efficiently. 
Um, and again, I'll always say this every time anybody will ask me, this ERP project is a business transformation project. It's not solely an IT project. That's why I have my two colleagues here with me. Um, and a lot of the focus is on business process redesign, reimagining, looking at efficiencies across all of these business functions. All right, overall project status. If you recall, we started, we kicked off the project officially in October of 2023. We met with our integration vendor, AST. We started the requirements gathering. Um, we've, since that time, we've actually gone through and done our first round of data migration, which um, I wanna say thank you to the HR team and the finance team because they've spent quite a lot of time and energy in working with our teams to do the data mapping from a highly customized legacy system to the new Oracle platform. And I'm, I'm happy to say with the first round of data migration, I was pleasantly pleased that um, we hit an 80%, over, a little over 80% success rate given the what we had to start with. So it's really, really, really great. And a lot of that is to the hard work that the team has done in putting together the data mapping. With that said, um, I am pleased to say that we are on track um, to meet our March 2025 launch of HR and the finance piece, which um, the payroll, but that also includes a chart of accounts. So what I'd like to do is briefly turn it over to my colleagues here. We're gonna talk about, as I mentioned, this is a business transformation project. So there are key decisions that we've made that impact the way BCPS does business. So I'll let uh, Mr. McCall talk about the HR pieces. Mr. Hartlove will talk about what we've done to date with um, finance, and I'll touch on the IT components. Good evening. Um, growing up, I often was told not to rush life, but I'm telling you, we're looking forward to March of 2025. So that's good to say. Um, with that said, of course, I want to, of course, thank you, the board, as well as Dr. Rogers, and also my colleagues here, and also the countless individuals from Human Resources put in the countless hours of working to make sure that this um, project is uh, put through with fidelity uh, to its fullest extent. So I would have to go on record to say thank you to the team as well as uh, to you all as the board for uh, putting that trust and faith in us. Uh, when it comes to the uh, moving to a single incumbency for position control, um, there's no doubt, there's one position for the superintendent, there's one position that we have for the chief of staff or uh, the chief fiscal officer. Uh, but when you look across the system, we have a number of positions, for instance, like uh, science teachers or that of a, um, a classroom teacher at an elementary level. So when it comes to the single incumbency, uh, when a person applies to a position, they'll be able to apply specifically to a position in which that identifies that particular position and location and supervisor. Right now we have directors, a number of directors, a number of executive directors, a lot of them have the same number, <laughs> have the same position or title code. So with that, with Oracle, we'll be able to uh, identify the, say for instance, because we will be asked to, to pull data um, I'm sure, <laughs> of the number of, yes, we will. <laughs> <laughs> and we all have to go to the number of different spreadsheet or databases for this. We'll be able to pull the number of vacancies, say for instance, for science teachers at Pikesville High School without having to like run and scramble and try to get everybody on the same page and then send that information to the superintendent. Uh, so we have, have that at, at, um, at our fingertips. So that's the one uh, uh, aspect that I know that we have definitely been working on, the single incumbency. When it comes to streamlining, we wanna make sure that experience for those folks coming into BCPS is a very good first impression. So when they apply to Oracle, then of course the experience of being able to move through seamlessly into Silk Road for their onboarding experience, and then from there to other facets within the system to payroll, a lot of other key pieces as everyone who's sitting here at the table, have a, a part of this system. So without having to you know, manually push somebody through, 
we have those, those interfaces working together to be able to then move them through those various um, uh, human resources management modules. So that is another aspect of which we really are excited about. And uh, of course, with the, that streamlined process and pulling the data, and also for the employee themselves, the employee self-service is another aspect that they'll be able to go in and say, okay, well, how much leave do I have? How much, what are my paychecks or what have you would look like? Any inf information that they need will be at their fingertips as well. So with that said, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Hartlove. There you go. Sure. Um, in, in this phase of, of the implementation, finance has been, has been uh, concentrating mainly on the chart of accounts to start with, but also uh, payroll as well. Um, with regards to the chart of accounts, uh, the chart of accounts is kind of the, the language of accounting and, and uh, the, how, we, how we cost things out. It's how we code things. Um, we, what we're doing uh, with our chart of accounts design is we're trying to simplify it, we're trying to make it more efficient, and we're trying to make it aligned with MSDE, uh, which will allow ultimately our reporting. We have a lot of interfaces with MSDE, so it'll allow those, the reporting, the interface, the exchange of data between us and MSDE to be much, much uh, smoother. So that's where the chart of accounts comes in. Uh, with regards to payroll, um, uh, payroll obviously is a critical uh, area and we're looking at best practices. This is an opportunity uh, to, to question how we do things and make sure we're doing things um, th that are aligned to best practices uh, for how to pay people. The biggest thing we're looking at right now is aligning our time and attendance systems uh, to the negotiated agreements to make sure people are paid uh, per the negotiated agreements, make sure they're, make sure they're uh, paid properly. So the Oracle pro uh, product is uh, is is a is a great system, and it's a it's allowing us to uh, to uh, uh, implement these best practices to make sure people get paid efficiently going forward. So th that's really where finance is. We're really going to ramp up in finance in the next phase, where we'll get into a lot of the other areas, the budgeting, the procurement, um, and the and the hardcore accounting will be in the next phase of implementation. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> and then with the IT, um, the identifying the historical data needs and selecting appropriate storage. What I mean by that is, and what we've done is, we're focusing in identifying, and in, in this case, employee HR data that needs to be migrated from the legacy system and only that data. So we want to make sure that the data that is needed at the time is in the Oracle platform, but then also the legacy data that is not needed, we're going to have that stored so that if there are any audits that go beyond the span of the data that we have in the Oracle platform, we'll have easy access to it. So those are the kind of things from an IT perspective we're looking at. And you've heard the um, integration to efficiency. So again, our primary focus is to make sure we have everything in the native Oracle platform, but there are certain cases where it makes sense to have a, another product that can do the job a little bit better, um, but that we have the seamless integration so that the at, the at the end of the day, the customer experience isn't impacted by using a separate system. Um, we're closely integrating uh, these systems. Then what is on the horizon? As I mentioned, we'll be, on, we'll be doing the data validation on ongoing basis. We're bringing in more and more data. We're, um, evaluating it, scrubbing it where necessary, going through second phases. Uh, we're also going to be doing what we're calling the system integration testing. And what that really is, is um, the team, our integration team has worked with uh, our internal teams to, based on the requirements, to configure the system to meet those requirements, so the business processes. So what we're doing with the system integration testing is we're testing those business workflows, making sure that they meet the expectations, if there is an integration of in that workflow to a, um, an external third-party system, we're making sure that that's also working. Um, we talked about the integration development, um, integration to the time and attendance system, integration to the applicant management system. Uh, those will be ongoing. And then most importantly here, and I just want to highlight this, is the creation. We've created the change management board. Historically, 
with ERP implementations, one of the key success factors is to make sure that you have a robust change management process in place. There's a lot of communication that needs to take place um, for the sole purpose of making sure that people understand the new processes that are in place, adoption of the system, because change is hard, and we're trying to get people to embrace these new business practices that are embedded into the platform. So with that, the Change Management Board has been tasked with identifying those communication needs and then pulling in stakeholders as needed. So if we get to the point where there are discussions that need to be had with the bargaining units, we have a member on the board who can be able to pull people in on an as-needed basis to get that stakeholder feedback. And at this point, we are open to any questions you might have. Thank you for that. Any questions from the board? Go ahead, Ms. Ann. I could keep you here, all three of you here all night, but thank you for the presentation because I have tons of questions, but this is my area of interest, so thank you very much. Um, I'll limit those, of course. Um, Mr. Augusto, to, yes. when you spoke of the third-party integrations, are you taking a critical look at those sub-processes um, and considering how to improve those as well as the core processes? And, and I'm asking about integrating. What we're taking the time to integrate, are we also looking at those processes to say, hey, is this something we can take the opportunity to improve before we do that work of integrating it with a brand new system. Sure. So um, <clears throat> I'll answer in two ways. So one is um, just out of the gate, um, and this is the approach that Oracle and our integration vendor has brought to us, is, is the design to standard approach where, as I mentioned, there are best practices that are embedded into the system. And really, I was just in jury duty, so it's the burden of proof here is we have to justify and we have to make the case as to why we're not following a best practice that's in the system rather than the other way where you can just say, well, I don't care how you have it in the system. We do it this way. So, and that's part of, and, and actually that's been the mandate of Dr. Rogers. She's mentioned in many meetings that we're not here to do the same thing that we've done in the past if it doesn't make sense. Um, with integration, as I mentioned before, our First approach is, okay, can this be handled by the platform? Because obviously there are um, advantages to using a function that's native within the system um, and also some cost implications as well. However, we have done with the um, third party tools that we're using right now, we've done the due diligence, we've worked through, we've gathered business requirements, we worked with the vendor to see what functionality was within the Oracle platform. And then collectively, we made the decision that it makes business sense to go with this third-party tool. And then at that point, we start working on what the integration pieces are. OK. So you're saying, and, and thank you for that response, the legacy pieces, we're ensuring that that still makes sense to, to integrate versus Not legacy pieces, migrating. no. It's, um, or we, apps. We actually party. separate the systems from the business functions. So the very first thing we're doing is looking at business requirements, and we're saying, this is what we need to have happen. And then at that point, we say, what can we do? What can be done with the Oracle platform? And if it's a third party tool, we're not necessarily saying that it's the legacy system that we have. Um, we actually do, we did our market analysis. Um, I'll give an example. So what we're using was Silk Road for applicant tracking. It's an incumbent application that we've integrated with our existing ERP. We went out to the marketplace and looked at alternatives. But at the end of the day, we came back and said, okay, this is the best product for us. So we decided to go with the integration. Thank you. And how are we defining legacy records for the purpose of the migration? Um, <coughs> for, um, so it, for, human for now, resources yeah, so what we're doing with human resources. So uh, legacy record a is anything that's in our existing uh, ERP system, CGI. We're then also looking at what we did is to met with the HR team to say from a recording, a reporting standpoint, and from an operation <coughs> standpoint, how much of this data did we need? So we went through an analysis of all of the fields 
and the time frame. So for um, employment history, we wanted to know up to a certain point. All of that data would be migrated into the new platform. And then we looked at data that specific fields that would be needed. If we needed that, that was migrated into the new platform. However, the legacy data is still there and will be maintained in a read-only state. Okay, the constituency I'm thinking of would be our retirees. They may not be active in, in the system, but at any point could become, mm -hmm. um, hopefully rehires, you know, hopefully, but that, that's data that could be in any um, given location, but that could be needed at yes, some point. Yes, an example of, of valid use case for that is um, we had to pull in information from retirees because we need information for um, retirement for benefit pension any reporting purposes so yes so that was again thank you to the HR team because that's the kind of knowledge that they provided and they gave us guidance on what data to keep definitely and my next question is for mr. McCall and thank you for sharing about the application front end yes um, that's great news to hear um, that's going to be wonderful for our applicants and when we speak about retention you know the more positive that experience can be from day one hitting the road I just think that um, starts them off on a, on a great start an introduction to BCPS absolutely my question is will there be a unified system no matter what position you're applying for out of the gate in in terms of your applicant experience driver, teacher, um, whatever position is it, it is within BCPS. Yes. Will yes. that be the, ex the, experience? the experience? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Terrific. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. And I'll turn it over. I Thank you. I had more, but yeah. Yep. I'll turn it over <laughs> to the rest of the board. Um, I have one question. Are we on track with the initial timeline that was presented for the implementation of, um, for the full implementation of this system? Yes. Okay. So what, what you see here was pulled from the original, uh, the first implementation. So we haven't changed any dates. Okay. So we're tracking toward our baseline dates. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for the next item on the agenda, we um, we skipped over Ms. Drummond's report uh, because of technical difficulties. So Ms. Drummond, are you uh, ready to provide your report? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Since my last report, I visited Perry Hall High, Kenwood High, Overly High, um, Golden Ring Middle, Towson High and Dumbarton Middle. I've been focusing on getting to know students and having more personal conversations with them. Um, I love like going in classrooms and just hearing what they have to say, um, the questions that they ask and all of that. I've had my first of many meetings with the 2024-2025 SMOB to give her more information and insight on the role she will hold for the next year. Coming up, I will be attending and cutting the ribbon for Parkville's Little Free Library opening tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item on the agenda is information. The first item is the March meeting minutes of the Southeast Area Advisory Council. The next two items are the revised superintendent rules 1300 and 8130. The last item is the final report on key school legislation that has been introduced and presented during this session. The next item on the agenda is board member comments and agen agenda setting. I will start with Ms. Daleski. I um, just wanna say happy teacher appreciation and nurse appreciation to everybody in BCPS. Th thank you. Dr. Savoy. Uh, share her same sentiment. Happy teacher appreciation day and happy nurses day to everyone who's been or ever wanted to be a nurse or a teacher. Okay, Mr. McMillian. No, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Harvey? I have no comments at this time, thank you. Mr. Young? No comments at this time. Ms. Dominowski? Ms. Hinn? No comments. Ms. Frimpong? Um, one of the items that was in our contracts was 
um, an informational item, um, and it spoke specifically to Sparrow's point. Um, so one thing I'd like to look at as far as a future agenda item would be, we've heard it before from the um, Southeast Advisory, um, but again, in keeping with my eye pass, um, looking at when we can actually separate Northwood um, from Hollabird um, and get the fourth and fifth graders back into the elementary schools. Ms. Lichter? Ms. Pumphrey? No comments, thank you. Ms. Drummond? No comment. Okay, and um, the last one is me. And I, I don't have any comments, but it's also Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So um, just wanted to recognize that as well. Okay, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 21st, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. On Wednesday, May 22nd, the board will hold a virtual public hearing on the FY 2026 capital budget via a Microsoft Teams event. The link to register to speak at this hearing will be provided on the participation by the public webpage and can be found in board docs. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.